lot, Mike. When um, do you remember when we first met? Well, you know, Chad, it's interesting. I uh, I remember um, because I was in the hi-fi business at that time. I had a hi-fi shop in Lower Manhattan, about six blocks from the World Trade Center, called Hobson Ultimate Sound. And um, one of the things that I prided myself in was, in addition to selling hi-fi, was that I had a lot of records because I was an all, well, not a completely all analog shop, but really, you know, I was still into analog. And so I had a lot of current pressings and so forth. And so, but there weren't a lot of things around. And I remember that you and a couple of other folks, you know, remember that guy, Joe Tumbarello, uh, he had a couple different names. He was from Long Island. Oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. He that, went by, yeah. like, three different names, right? And, yeah. And he put out that uh, Rachmaninoff Symphonic Dances. And that was a big hit, right? And uh, at the same time, you were starting to put out some stuff. And so I stocked all of that stuff in my shop. And I think I, I was stocking all that before I actually knew you. And I had met you, but you know, so you were kind of already a legend in my <laughs> mind when, when back, all the way back then. Well, we were just yeah. good. That was the start. I mean, I remember uh, the Rock Mountain off, and then, then we did Le Cid in 1989. Yeah. So this is probably... I had those records. I bought 10 copies and to give away, actually, not to sell. Because, you know, was, I, and I probably should have sold them, but <laughs> my idea was that when I would play something for somebody and they went, oh, my God, that's wonderful. Or, or when they bought a piece of hi-fi equipment, that I would just, like, be able to give them a record. And I actually did that quite a lot, and it was very successful. Well, yeah, so you had a nice hi-fi store, and you would buy records from us. and um, But, you know... I guess I can't remember when we first exactly met, but I know we had a mutual uh, friendship with George Cardis. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, George is, I, I guess he's, in my mind, one of the most important people. I mean, there's all these other people that are important in hi-fi, but George Cardis, for this era anyway, for the last 25 or 30 years, I think he's one of the the instrumental people in this business. and. He taught me so much about uh, great recordings and uh, introduced me to Ben Harper. I mean, it's just like, the, it goes on and on. But he was always a big fan of what you were doing. And so we, we probably did actually meet for the first time, you know, with George. Because he was, he's, George has always been a real connector. Right, and then you were a rolling dealer too. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and I card his cable... Right. And Hobson Ultimate Sound, 1989 to 1985, 1995. Um, yeah, it was a it was a crazy time in New York City, and so the what was happening is there was very little stuff being issued on vinyl, and then there was even less really great things being issued on vinyl at the time. So well, I mean, vinyl almost died if you remember, during that period. Yeah. And to be honest, I mean, you know, uh, people say, oh, you know, Hobson, you revived the record business, and Cassim, you did that. But to be honest, it wasn't us. It was really the dub guys and, and the guys that were cutting stuff on lacquer during the time when vinyl was on the way down, right? And those guys kept the lacquer business going. And and that allowed us when when, you know, it was time to bring some audiophile vinyl back that there was still lacquers around, right? Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it was kind of crazy, but... Um, yeah, there was for the dance clubs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, for dance records and so forth. I mean, if it hadn't been for those guys, we wouldn't be here right now, and there wouldn't be any vinyl. There wouldn't be a, re, you know, a revival or anything because, you know, if the lacquer business had shut down it would have all gone away. You couldn't revive it, in other words. Yeah, no, there was a few things. Uh, there was definitely that. And, uh, but, uh, so, you know, I know that we were all trying to think of different things to reissue at the time. At the time, there wasn't much for me to sell 
and you to sell or you to demo stuff right. with. There right. wasn't much. So I know you were kind of thinking the same as me. Everybody wanted the RCAs. I mean, every absolute sound was just going on and on about the original RCAs and living mer uh, the Mercury living, living presence. presence. But you know, it's interesting because at that time, let's not forget that five years earlier, the Cheskies had reissued a bunch of the living stereos with their plain white Chesky covers. And I just want to say for the record, that it's not a dig because they couldn't use the original artwork. They asked for it. Maybe they didn't ask for it the right way or hard enough, but they weren't allowed to use the original covers or the original labels. And so when it came time in 1993, when this idea came up, and I kind of had the idea of reissuing the RCAs, um, we went into RCA in, in sort of the summer, early fall of 1993, and a guy called Bernie Lose, and he is the instrumental character in this plot, because if it weren't for him, he was the head of business affairs at the time, if it weren't for him, none of this would have happened. And God love him, he understood that, you know, vinyl was basically dead. CD was the, you know, the, the revenue stream. And that classical music on vinyl? I mean, really? And he believed in it. But we said to him, the most important thing is that we have to have the original artwork, the original labels, and of course, we have to have the most original masters. And we'll get into that a little later, but the they bought into that for the first time ever. And so even though the Cheskies had reissued this material, some of the most famous great classic recordings, the Reiner Scheherazade, the Reiner Pines, and, and, and so on, the, the thing was that what collectors wanted was, and audiophiles wanted, was they wanted that original artwork. They wanted to, to think that they were buying something in 1961 or 62 as an original, right? And so I think that was one of the keys that we were able to do was to convince RCA at the time. And, you know, if I take a little tiny bit of credit, it was for my passion coming from the hi-fi background and coming from the record collector background to say to these folks, we're gonna, we wanna do this and we wanna do it right. We wanna honor RCA, we wanna honor the artists. And oh, by the way, we're, we wanna do 20 titles. <laughs> and they went, whoa, 20 titles? And I will say that I give Chad credit for having started the whole thing along with this one-off of the Rachmaninoff Symphonic Dances. But Chad really started and and started bringing stuff out, onesie twosies, you know, this and he would bring out one and he'd bring out another and, you know, it was, and all of a sudden we just went, you know what, let's just roll the dice here and let's just guarantee RCA $200,000 in year one, right? We're gonna do 20 titles. And they just went, okay. 200,000 in, in 94. So it was plus on we, vinyl, but plus two hundred thousand to us. Oh, right. I mean, you know, dude, I was sweating the night. You know, I was like, uh, is this gonna work? You know, you know, are they gonna? I'm gonna end up in jail. You know, but but anyway. what about why did they not let Chesky use the art? Like, what was the? I mean, what's the problem? You know, it's a good question. I think uh, maybe it's a timing issue is my yeah. guess, mm -hmm. right? It was it was a, a period then where CDs were coming out and it was like vinyl was like, oh, okay, you could do this, but we don't want to detract from the CDs. I think by the time we got there, it was like CDs are the mainstream format. Vinyl's dead. Certainly vinyl was dead on the classical front. There was no reissue vinyl on classical 
outside of what Chad was doing and a few little things here and there it was like it was dead it was done and like there was new vinyl coming out on artists that would release records but that was all coming out of Europe so there was almost nothing being pressed in the United States yeah. that, that was current you know so um, I think it was a tiny issue, yeah. to be honest. It, you know, I don't want to take too much credit for it, but I... Well, no, when you... Listen, you know, when you say this is part of the deal, the only way we're going to do this, yeah. you know, and I have to, to do it with a, a lot of the major labels when we do it, we are interested only in doing this if we can use the original master recording. Yeah. And if you yeah. make it clear to be that the beginning, you know, that's part of the deal. Yeah. And you made it clear yeah. that this is... You wanted this, this, and that, and uh, and and then it's timing too. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, but I I I remember um, that you know you and I and everybody was kind of like reading the absolute sound, and I was also we were buying the originals. Yeah, for big oh, yeah. bucks, big money. Trade buy, sell, big and trading. Money. I mean, this was a time you'll. I'm sure you remember. And I my favorite story is. I had an original copy of the Royal Ballet, LES 6065. I sold it to, in my words, a nice German man for $1,800 to help finance the startup that was Classic Records. Wow. I mean, RCA Living Stereos and Mercury Living Presence, but RCA Living Stereos were going for crazy money. Like, Witch's Brew was like 1500 bucks, you know, an original copy of Zarathustra, 18, LSC 1806, which is the one we started with, which is the most coveted. Those things were going for $2,000 if you could find one, right? And so that was, you know, the, the, the whole idea was, let's start with the biggest title. And the biggest title, by the way, was the one that was made popular by one man, and that was Harry Pearson. The 1954 recording of Alza Sprock Zarathustra with Reiner at Chicago Symphony Hall was became coveted, and it unfortunately was not a title that was terribly successful. It was the early days of stereo, 1960, one of the first stereo recordings that came out. Most people didn't have stereo playback decks. And the mono version of that LM1806 was a dollar cheaper, right? So not many of those records were actually pressed in their original form, the 1S, 1S. And there was never anything else. There was not a 2S, a 5S. It was only one pressing. And so these records were really rare, at least in part by virtue of when they came out. But then later, 40 years later, Pearson, Sid Marks, others popularized these records and no one can find them. So they were incredibly impossible to find. But everybody was like, I got to hear this on my hi-fi system. So I, I recognized that and knew that that was the first title along with a, a kind of a, I'm going to say, even though it's a great recording, a bit of a throwaway, Gaete Parisian, LSC 18, 1817, from Arthur Fiedler and the Boston Pops. Another great recording, a little lighter, if you will, in terms of classical significance. But those are the first two titles we started with. And, and Chad can probably share with you how that all went down. So... Anyway, you know, everybody's trying to do their, well, me and Mike and uh, a few others were trying to do our part, either reissuing or we'd buy and sell and collect the originals, which, I mean, they were going for lots of money, you know, $500, you know, if you got a clean copy. So, I mean, we're all going to the, I mean, how many times were we digging in record stores? Just, yeah. just digging. I mean, yeah. lucky we were young because... Yeah. I don't think yeah. we would, you know, we would have went through all that, that trouble. Uh, well, I still have some of that dust in my lungs. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, so, and uh, so we, um, you know, here we are, the CES is fixing to come. And back then, that's when they had the WCES and the CES. Right. 
right. And uh, one was in Vegas. And the WCES was in Chicago. In the summer. In the summer. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Wait, wait. Well, maybe the W is the winter CES was in Vegas. Okay. And then the the, okay. the other the the one other one was in June in in Chicago. So was, and it was hot. So I was mistaken. So every six month, you know, every year. Every other six months, it'd either be Vegas or Chicago, right. until finally they just decided to, to do it in uh, not much longer. They would just decided to do it in Vegas. Yeah. Um, so we're uh, it's coming up for the show in Vegas, and there's a postcard with a question mark that uh, I get, that Don McKinnis at RTI gets, that you know the reviewers Michael Fremer gets, and Harry Pearson and everybody gets this, this, I mean, dude, that was the yeah. most, I mean, I have to admit that was some genius marketing yeah. in the old school way yeah. that just can't yeah. be topped. I mean, it, that was just cause I know what it did because I, it, it did it to me. And so, you know, if you want to hear the latest, greatest news in, you know, audio file reissue or something, Come to this room at this time yeah. for the press release conference. And it so, was it, and it was actually the Jeff Rowland Design Group because, as at Hobson Ultimate Sound, which I owned at the time of starting Classic Records, I had a hi-fi shop in Lower Manhattan on Duane Street, and I represented Jeff Rowland Design Group. So, you know, I called Jeff up and I said, "Hey, can I have an announcement in your room in the Sahara Hotel?" And he said, "Sure." And uh, so, you know, we sent out this postcard and, and as a teaser, and uh, 200 people showed up. And <laughs> it, was, it was a pretty big room, but there were people out in the hallway. It was like, oh, my God, no one really, we, we had no idea that it would turn out that way. Well, he, he skipped some f a funny part. Yeah. But uh, so... We, we get to Vegas, and I'm calling Don before, hey, man, did you get that book? Yeah, I did. Man, what it, I don't know. And nobody, yeah, nobody knew. you did a good we job. Kept, we kept it quiet. And that's the most important thing, because yeah. if you just let yeah. the cat out the bat, it wouldn't have had the effect. Yeah. So nobody knew, so we're talking, we're just freaking out. We can't wait to see what it is. Yeah. Somehow we knew it was going to be something that we were interested in. So... The the night before the the conference or the press release, Mike calls me, him and Ying Tan, and he says, "Hey, listen, Chad. He says, um, I want to take you out to dinner. Um, let's go to Spago's in uh, yeah. Caesar's Palace." <laughs> yeah. I'm like, "Ooh, something's up." Yeah. So I get down there, and it's just us three. So they they playing it cool, man. You know, and I'm like, you know, all right. What's up? You know, like, like I'm, I'm, you know, we're we're catching up. We're having a good time. We're eating. Everything's great. We're, uh, so. He pulls out this red uh, binder. And uh, and inside, the binder, was um, a color Xerox. A color Xerox. And by the way, not a good color Xerox. Okay, this. Nobody remembers this, but 1994, into 1993, early 1994, I mean, you know, color printers didn't exist. So it was, this, it, it was yeah, pretty but, cheesy. Yeah, but you know what? The images that it had on it yeah. just jumped out yeah. and slapped you about the face. Yeah. So when he threw that piece of paper down... And it's like what everybody was trying to get didn't ever look like it was ever going to happen. Yeah. Boom. I mean, it was just like, whoa. You know, we just, he could have, how do you say, knocked me over with a feather. And, yeah. uh, and so I'm like, wow, this is great. This is crazy. I mean, wow, how did you do it? You know, and he's like, well, Chad, we want you to be our distributor. I was going to say, that's the most important thing. And Chad talks about the idea that, you know, the question mark and the la, la, la. The issue was that I, I hoped 
I had an idea that this was the right way forward. You know, doing these titles, starting with the right ones, doing 20 and promising the market that like, it wasn't just like, oh, okay, we're gonna try one or two and then we'll see where it goes. And by the way, I'm just gonna say, uh, in deference to the, to the late Dave Wilson, he tried something around the same time and he started with one title and maybe he didn't pick the best title, God love him, a title that he loved, but maybe that the market didn't really care about, but it was one title. And what the market really craved was to know that there was more coming, right? And I think if there was anything that was clever, fortuitous really is better the better word or lucky, was that we said, you know what, let's just go, let's go for broke. Let's do 20 titles. Let's guarantee them. Let's do it. And let's announce that we're doing 20 titles so people have something to look forward to. And it turns out in hindsight to be a really, really great thing. But the key for me in this whole issue was to have Chad on board with this because at that time, and it maintains to this moment, he was and remains the biggest retailer, distributor of audiophile vinyl and music and a, and a devout music lover. Um, and it was like, I said to the person that I brought in, Ying Tan at the time, who was very short lived in the classic records history, he decided to exit for reasons which I won't go into right now. But I said to Ying, look, Chad's the key to success here. And I'll tell you right now, just be honest and open, Chad's initial orders for every one of the original titles, 5,000 copies, out the door. And it just went boom, like that. Well, you had them like two a month, man. They were yeah. coming out. And I mean, you know, when you're taking a lot of copies, you know, yeah, you I mean, they were selling, they were selling, they were selling, but you know, it's like, it was, we put some pressure on them to like, you know, so he was the exclusive distributor in the United States. It's like, we, you know, so yeah, it was, uh, there was some pressure, but I mean, they were selling, it was all great, but I, I agree with you. The fact that you were able to say, hey, 20's coming. Yeah. Hardly anybody does that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, they don't, and you stuck to it, and you kept a schedule going, and then you learned. You <laughs> stuck your head up. Yeah. You know, you really learned how the whole thing, you worked with Bernie, mastering everyone, yeah. You went, you learned from Ed Tobin the best. Yeah. Ed, I think, might have taught Gary a thing. A thing or two. two. Yeah. Uh, you worked with Gary. Yeah. You've worked with uh, Rick, Rick, Rick Hashimoto. Hashimoto at RTI, and they, they would work with Bernie and all of them as a team. Yeah. And, uh, and they, and you learned the craft. Uh, you, you had to, to keep, to keep pushing for, for, for the higher quality. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say, Chad, I, I'm humbled by how little I knew um, when I started this whole thing. You know, um, I, mean, I was a record collector, a vinyl lover, uh, had a hi-fi shop that was analog focused and, and so on and so forth. And I thought I knew, you know, I mean, naively, I thought I knew a lot about vinyl. It turns out I knew next to nothing, and um, it, you're right, it was a humbling experience. And I think, again, if I take any credit, it was that I was smart enough not to get in my own way, was to enlist people like Bernie Grunman and Ed Tobin and Rick Hashimoto and RTI at the time and so forth, um, but really to inspire them all because they were already working at a pretty high level, but it was always about how can we do this a little bit better? How can we, you know, and so it's all about innovation. And 
to be honest, and Chad, you'll you'll know this, that the the record industry or any manufacturing business is really about consistency. When they find a way of manufacturing something that's consistent, you don't get any, the customer's happy and so forth. It's like, let's just keep doing this. And my attitude was, okay, this is good, but can we do it better? And I think by asking those questions and by being side by side, I used to go, I used to deliver lacquers. We'd cut lacquers at, at, at the end of the day with Grunman at, but you know, we'd end the day at like six o'clock and I would have those lacquers at Ed Tobin's shop at 5 a.m. I would drive them down there and go to breakfast with Ed and he would play them while I watched. He would silver and play them and then we would talk and he would teach me about the importance of plating and how that affects the quality of the final pressing and working with the guys at RTI and innovating the profile and the vinyl formulas and so forth. It was like I was learning by interacting with the best people in the industry. And so, you know, if, if the only thing I really brought was an intrigue about trying to make things better and you know, I will say, I'm going to say this early on in this conversation, that I am so happy and proud to, to sit next to this man who took what I started, both in classic records and in the pressing plant, and has taken it to a, a, a level that I aspired to but didn't get to. And... It's, it's amazing to see that handoff go in a way that we're now, this man is making the best records in the universe, period. Sorry, period. Well, dude, I learned a lot from you. And, uh, you know, I know you and Don... When I bought those two Lexus. Yeah. <laughs> we tried to stop you. <laughs> and uh, I bought them two Lexus yeah. and they both tried to stop me. Yeah, and all presses are not made equal. We'll put it that way. And, you know, one of the things I learned, I mean, you know, I know more about pressing records than I ever wanted to know. And thank God I was so fortunate to sell the company to Chad and he can continue it so that I can go back to listening and appreciating not only the things that I pressed and we put out, but the things that Chad's putting out now. He just played me some stuff tonight that just blew my mind, right? And he and I have this kind of connection around blues and uh, music, you know, from Louisiana and things that are like very rootsy and, and, and uh, passionate, right? And he played me some stuff that's like, man, you know what? I'll take that any time over <laughs> Scheherazade. You know, and I love Scheherazade, but, you know. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's been a, a, a really interesting journey in learning about uh, machines, about vinyl formulas, about profiles, um, you know, we can get into some of that, um, you know, hand press stuff, um, you know, where, where it's not an automatic machine and how that impacts the sound of, the, of that polyvinyl chloride, that plastic record that you put on the turntable and play back. It, it all matters and, and it all matters a lot. Well, you know, like, I didn't know what a fine belt was. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you, you figured out. I bought it out. a couple from Jamaica <laughs> yeah. and had them shipped. So, you know. <laughs> which he got. Right. Thank God. And I, you know, so Mike was, like they say, going down the rabbit hole. Yeah. The new saying these days. Yeah. yeah. He was way down there. 
and figuring out about the, the fine built manual, about SMTs, about the flat profile, uh, trying about taking to, about taking carbon black out of records, which Chad's now, you know, we started the whole notion of clarity vinyl, which was taking the carbon black out of the LPs. And by the way, I'm just going to give credit where credit is due here. Michael Fremer um, invited me out to his house. I've been out there many times in New Jersey. I used to live in New Jersey, so we knew each other from out there many, many years ago. But he invited me out, and I came out, and he said, "Hey, let me do. Let me. Let me. Let me show you something." Played me a record. Uh, can't remember what it was. Oh, actually, I know what it was. It was a record we put out. It was this. Um, a, a movie that Bob Dylan did. He was involved in, and there were all these songs by Bob Dylan. Uh, what the um, heck? Uh, uh, Remember the name? Yeah, of yeah, no, I know. And there's that and, female vocal. Yeah, that, and, that, and and so he said, "Well, what do you want to hear?" I'll I'll think of the name of the record in a minute. So it, it's a double album we put out, and it didn't really sell that well. But there's this one song I so I said, "You know, I know this song really well." So he played me this song on his system in the basement of his house. And I said, oh, yeah, okay, that's, that's good. And then he took it off, and he took it over to this device, and he put the record on, and he pushed the button, and then he took it off, and he brought it back over to the turntable and played it again. And I mean, literally, from the moment the stylus touched the groove, I went, oh, my goodness, what just happened? And he's like, oh, this is this Furatech DMAG machine. And I went, what? So, of course, my first impression was I have to get one of these because, you know, I've got 50,000 records that I own. I need to have one of these. But I dug deeper into it and met with the folks at Furatech, and they explained to me that the carbon black that's put into LP, into polyvinyl chloride to make records into the, into the vinyl formula, actually has trace metallic parts in it. And so when you have trace metallic parts and you're spinning it around on a platter, there's a electromagnetic interference. And that interferes with the cartridge, which is an electromagnetic transducer. And so it affects the signal at the cartridge, it kind of blurs things, if you will. And so I thought, okay, so what, what happens with this demagnetizer is that it kind of, you know, evens things out in a certain way, right? So that there's not trace magnetic fields and so forth. So you get an increased level of clarity, so to speak when you play back something that's been demagnetized. So I'm sitting, I'm thinking, well, what happens if you take out the carbon black? So I reached out to the vinyl manufacturer and I said, hey, you know, can we make a formula that doesn't have the carbon black in it? And they went, yeah, we can. There's some problems and, you know, I won't go into the details of it, but we finally convinced them to, to make a formula for us. And we pressed some records and played those against the black vinyl versions, and it was shocking, the difference in the two. And so that was the birth of Clarity Vinyl, which was another innovation, which again, Chad has trademarked and is, is really involved in carrying that forward to its logical conclusion because it, it is really important in terms of getting the optimal level of playback non-distorted playback if you will from a vinyl record like tell me how um remind me how um you come up with the flat profile or you know like so many things chad you know, I God, you know, I wish I could claim any credit for this. But to be honest, it started with our I'm sorry to say this, obsession 
with trying to do the perfect blue note mono repressing. And the idea for people that don't know about this is that in the 50s, in the mid 50s, blue note records, mono blue note records were flat and they were really thick. Turns out about 200 grams. And they, they um, so we, we cut a blue note record in half and we profiled it and we made a die to go on the press at RTI that would press a blue note record, a reissue in modern times that was, you know, a replica of the original, including the deep groove in the label, which is another crazy story, but I won't go into. But so we, we developed this profile for blue note records. But so here's what happened. We pressed, we had pressed a title, and I think it was uh, one of the most famous, uh, BLP 1595, Hank Mobley. Mm -hmm. And we had pressed it previously on the RTI, the normal 180 gram pressing. And then we got this new die and we pressed it using the same metal parts, right, from the same uh, mother and so forth. And here in this room, we listened to, and I had like five or six different people, and we played the RTI 180 gram version profile, let's call it, versus the 200 gram profile, which was kind of what we thought was the authentic Blue Note profile, and like everybody in the room just went, what happened? What, what, what? This is incredible. The sound was so much more rich and defined and open and we're like, oh my God, what is going on here? Did I have any idea? Absolutely not. You know who had an idea? Doug Sachs at the mastering lab. I had lunch with Doug Sachs. There's another little side story, which I'll, and maybe I'll bring up, but I had a, a lunch with Doug Sachs and I shared this story with him. And he said, so you don't know why the difference, right? And I went, no. And he said, well, the RTI 180 gram pressing isn't flat. And I said, what do you mean? I mean, I hold the record up. It, you know, it's not bowed. It, it, he goes, no, that's not it. The profile of the record from start from the outer lip into the inner groove, it's not flat. It's actually concave. It like slopes down, gets flat in the middle, and then kind of slopes up. And I said, you're kidding me. And he said, no. And the one that you guys pressed is flat all the way across. And I thought about it for a second. It made a lot of sense. Because when you think about it, if you have a, a, a stylus and it's in a groove, if, if, it's, if the groove is going downhill, the stylus isn't in the groove perpendicular. And what does that mean? It means distortion. It means playback distortion. And so all records that aren't flat profile have playback distortion. It doesn't matter what tape you cut them from. It doesn't, no, it doesn't matter who mastered it. It doesn't matter what vinyl you use. There's playback distortion, period. It's not as good as it could be. And so that was an absolute revelation. Now here's the crazy news that JVC in Japan with their UHQR, which of course Chad has revived and is authentic with same, was a flat profile, 200 gram. That's why those UHQRs, which are rare and desirable, the originals, were so good because they were flat profile. And so we accidentally rediscovered something 
that no one really understood. And I'm, again, so happy that I could have just a piece in that rediscovery, but that Chad now is trumpeting that and making the best LPs, UHUR, flat profile, hand pressed, that you could possibly get. They're better than anything that has ever been. Wow, that's uh, that's pretty. <laughs> I mean, uh, there you go. We we just kind of trying to do what you did and uh, at the next level up. Well, I mean, you you had worked with RT. You you had worked a long time on that with RTI. Yeah. You worked on the clarity. Yep. You worked on the flat profile. Yep. And it took a long. It wasn't it like the oh, first no. day. Yeah. It took years. Right. It took years, and it took persuasion because you know what like i said before you, when you're doing something at a at a manufacturing facility be it records or tennis balls no one wants to change because it's working and so it was really a job and again if i take a little bit of credit it was for being enthusiastic enough to inspire or cajole or co cohort people uh, into participating with me. And I, I have to say they they were all wonderful. Rick Oshimoto, um, I mean, he's lost, he didn't have a lot of hair then, but he's lost, he lost a few hairs in the process of trying to make the, the sup the super vinyl profile, we called it the flat profile, a uh, reality. And, um, and, and he did a fantastic job. And, and I give all those people credit for, having persevered because if it weren't for them, you know, we, we'd we still be doing what everybody else is doing and we wouldn't have elevated things to the level that I started and Chad, I feel like that I handed the baton to Chad and he, you know, he really took that last leg, you know, in the 100 meter dash. He was, the, he's the, he's the guy sprinting to the end and um, has done a, a fantastic job. I wish in some ways, I could have continued on, but I'm I'm incredibly happy well, that, still, that Chad took it. You're still uh, encouraging and uh, challenging and um, asking, you know, what about this? Did you yeah. try that? Did you try that? But, you yeah. know, the other thing is Gary had a lot to do with it. And, oh, yeah. And he worked for you. Oh, yeah. And then oh, you yeah. recommended you... you yeah, you know, uh, that's a good story. Right. That's a good story. So, so you know, uh, I'll just, uh, you know, not to not to get anybody in trouble here, but uh, <laughs> Chad will remember this. You know, we were all pressing at RTI. And, you know, we all, we love RTI. We love all the folks there. They're just, they're wonderful people. And, and they've been in business a long time. And they make a quality product. But, you know, the major labels started to, at some point get back into the business, right? And they were started to do things, you know, so the major labels weren't gonna put out a bunch of different titles, right? Cause that's, you know, it's like, yeah, you gotta manage a bunch of stuff. So let's do a box set. And they were doing like, you know, box sets, like the doors and stuff that were like, you know, 25 records in the box and they wanted to do 10,000 of them. So that's 250,000 records. It's like, well, that's, you know, that's four or five months worth of pressing for RTI with nobody else being pressed. So, you know, there was that kind of like, well, okay, we're going to do this. But so it forced us to think of alternatives. And, you know, it forced me to think about other pressing plants. And I looked into a lot. And of course, there was nothing the equivalent of RTI, but we worked with a company at that time, Bill Smith Custom Records in El Segundo, California, not far from us here in Hollywood. And, uh, you know, Kevin Smith was uh, happy to help and uh, he had a couple fine builds. So the hand, the hand pressed, um, you know, uh, approach was started there and the the profile and so forth and then you know it was kind of hard to 
to be able to con control the quality process there. And so, uh, you know, Gary Sahlstrom, who was my production manager at the time, had been at RTI as the main plating guy and had plated a lot of our stuff after Ed Tobin passed and um, was, you know, just a wonderful, wonderful resource. Um, we found out about this pressing plant out in North Carolina that had been shut. And um, so we called them up and, you know, talked to them a little bit. And uh, they said, yeah, we're ready to sell. And so I said, okay, you know, let's, let's make the leap here. But Gary, there's only one condition. And that is you have to run this thing because I'm, I'm certainly not capable. And he said, okay, let's do this. And so we went out there and we packed that whole thing up and we brought it back to the West Coast on trains. And we put a pressing plant in downtown LA to be able to press classic records, records because of the, these issues I mentioned before. And, um, you know, RTI was overwhelmed with all the demand. There weren't any other pressing plants. And most of the other pressing plants, including United at the time, were pretty poor, to be honest. Um, and so we just had to do it ourselves. And uh, we spent a couple of years doing it. And I learned, again, more than I would like to have learned. But um, we figured out how to do things in the best way possible. And then at the appropriate time, it, you know, it was time to hand that off to Chad along with Classic Records. And that became the, the basis for uh, QRP, which Chad will remember that I named. He called me up one time. He goes, what are we going to call the company? And I'm doing a bad imitation of him now. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, I, that's a good question. What should you call the pressing plan? I said, you know, it should probably be something that speaks to what you're about. And I said, why don't you call it quality record pressing? Because, you know, when somebody hears quality record pressing, they know exactly what you're doing. And so from that was, was born QRP. It came from, you know, the humble beginnings of <laughs> the classic records pressing plant, which came out of necessity as a result of the, the environment at the time. And it's now, it's now grown into literally a world-class facility. I've been out and looked at it in awe. It's like, wow. So tell me, um... I remember how you said this when you were said, you know, Chad, you ought to buy these SMTs. <laughs> you know, you bought classic records. Yeah. Um, yeah. You should buy these SMTs, I'm telling you. And I said, well, well, Mike, I got like six Tulexes. Yeah, yeah. And you said something about, well, you're like the guy that has a car in the garage or something. Yeah. How, does that, how does that saying go? You know, <laughs> I don't quite remember that. I mean, maybe you can you can give me a little bit more of a... Well, of a it's hint. just a saying. I, I've, I think I've heard the saying before. Like, yeah. you have you have a car in the garage. Um, I, I just don't remember how you said it, but I yeah. knew what you meant. I mean, I, I wish I could remember that, that probably what was a clever comment at the time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it worked. It worked. I, mean, I knew it, what you mean. You, you yeah. meant the, the. I know what what you mean is, you you have a, you already have a car. You think, you're you're okay, you know, or, yeah. um, but, but but that's that's fine. Uh, I, I went ahead and listened to you and and bought them, and then you also encouraged me, listen. Have Mark come out there. Yeah. Have Mark set all this stuff up. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, the, the most important thing, even more important than that, was when, when Chad bought Classic Records in the pressing plant, I said, Chad, listen to me. If there's one thing that I can tell you that's important for your success, and I said, just if you if you if you forget about everything else I've ever told you or I ever will tell you, just do you have to do one thing. And he said, What was that? And I said, You have to hire Gary Salstrom. 
because Gary had left Classic Records, the pressing plant. Remember I said that the deal was that I would only buy the pressing plant in North Carolina and bring it to Los Angeles and reconvene it if Gary would run it. And he agreed. Well, he agreed for about 18 months. And then the commute got to him. And God love him. He's one of the most wonderful people in the world. Um, and I understood it when he came to me. He said, Mike, I can't do this anymore. And he went back to work for RTI. And so I had to run the pressing plant until I sold it to Chad. And I said to him, you gotta you've got to hire Gary Solstrom. Period. End of story. Because I knew he couldn't hire Rick Hashimoto, which, you know, at the time... If you could hire anybody in the world, it might have been Rick, but there was no way Rick was leaving RTI and Camarillo for, you know, family reasons and so forth. I said, you got to hire Gary Solstrom, and he did it. And I, I personally believe, and I don't know what Chad's opinion is, but I personally believe that that was the key to the success that Chad has and will continue to have in Salina with this wonderful pressing plant. That was the key. Well, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. I mean, you know, without Gary, we don't have anything. And uh, that's for sure. You know, he uh, he's, he's the one that, uh, you know, he got so much experience at Wakefield and then RTI yeah. and then with you at Classic. Yeah. And then when you all went press at, at Bill Smith's, yeah. then when you opened up your own pressing yeah. plant, yeah. then when he went back to uh, RTI. So See, uh, he was really a plating guy. So he didn't, you know, while Gary had been around pressing at RTI and other places, he was really in plating, which is a critical part of the process, but it's not the only part of the process. Like you can have really good stampers and still make really bad records, right? And vice so, versa. And vice versa. But so for Gary, it was really that that coming out right it was you know like i've been over in the pressing plant and i know what they do and i see what they do but like you couldn't put gary on a machine at rti and and have him press records right so he like he understood it but he never really did it but when we started the pressing plant in downtown los angeles he did it and we hired a guy that gary knew uh, Mark and, um, you know, a quirky individual, um, kind of crazy, very Republican. And, uh, <laughs> and that's not a bad thing. It's just, that's what he is. And, uh, you know, but boy, did he know about SMT presses, right? And, and he was really the key to getting us started and then he came along for the ride when Chad bought the presses and then added more and, and got QRP going. Yeah, so you you introduced me to Mark. I had knew Gary as you and me both pressed at RTI. I will say that for the record, that RTI, uh, we were great customers. Yeah. Uh, and still friends with yeah. them uh go good on, people go on vacations with don the owner yeah rick helps us yeah anytime we have a question he's he's one of the masters in the world I agree. at what he does he helps us they don't have to they don't have yeah. to at all i mean they could look at us as competition but the way we um it's a friendly competition and we're both trying to make good quality records and we're both about as busy as we can be. Yeah. So, um, but you know, there's, they have experience. Uh, Rick has more experience and he shares it. And uh, both him and Don are, are uh, very generous in that regard. And uh, Absolutely. They're, they're doing quite good. and. And, uh, and we, we're, you know, it's been a long time. We've been knowing you and them and for... I mean, uh, 
30 years. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a 30, 30 year long thing. One of the things I wanted to point out, and you know, I appreciate you being deferential towards RTI, and I, of course I am too. Um, I love all those guys. Um, but one of the things that we realized in trying to push uh, making records better, and, and again, sometimes making records better means that the process of doing that is harder. Right. It, again, it's not it, it, it. The consistency of making a better record is not so easy. Right. So, for example, one of the things we realized when I bought these SMT presses and we got them going and so forth is, huh, like if you disconnect the hydraulic system from the press, because the hydraulic system is making all this noise and all this vibration. If you disconnect it, like just, you know, put it a foot away, it changes the sound of the records because there's feedback from the press into the vinyl when it's being pressed. When the vinyl's at 300 degrees, and the grooves are being pressed in by the stampers. And then they, you know, imagine you, you would want to keep that completely still. But if the press is vibrating, that vibration is going to get transmitted into the groove modulations. And then when it releases, you've got the vibration from the machine, the machine signature in the pressing, right? Now, no one ever thought about that. No one ever looked into that. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why the hand-pressed records on these, you know, these uh, fine -built. the fine-built machines, because they were made originally with the hydraulics separate, like 10, 15 feet away with the pipe coming over. And so the press itself was separate. So that's why those records sound better. Right? You could take the same stampers and put on, you know, uh, an SMT or a Hamilton or, you know, an Alpha Tulex and take and bring those over and put them onto a fine built and listen to the different pressings and you could hear the difference. How, why should there be a difference? It's the same vinyl, the same plates. Why should there be a difference? There is because of the vibration of the machine. And that was one of the things we discovered. And by the way, that's one of the great things about QRP. I hope I'm not giving away some of the secret sauce here. But they took that technology that we discovered by accident, again, you know, wasn't genius on our part, it was by accident. But they've taken it to the next step they have sensors in the uh, dies. the dies that monitor the temperature. And pressing records is about consistent temperature, period. You want to heat up to the same temperature every time and then cool down to the same temperature before releasing every single time. And if there's any variation in that, there's a variation in the quality and the sound quality of the record. And these guys took it to the next level up by putting sensors into the dies. It was an idea that we knew about, and I, I thought about, and I would have done, and I said when Chad bought the plant, I said, you know, listen, we've, I've talked to Mark about this, and he said, yeah, it's possible. They did it. And that's the reason why the, the pressings are, are the best on the planet. Well, you know, it's, um, you know, it's a lot of these things you keep saying, some of these things were accident, but yeah. you know, it's just like when people say they're lucky, it's like, yeah, well, the harder I work, the luckier I seem to be. Right. Well, the more you looked into, you right. know, you, you wouldn't have been lucky to find it if you weren't looking if to you begin. Weren't looking. 
And you know, nobody is trying to, if things are running, they're not trying to improve things. Improving things means a lot of time, a lot of money. Right. Right. And and nobody, you know, uh, a lot of people don't want to uh, to invest any more time or or money in in, in trying to improve things. But yeah. Um, and know, I mean, Chad, I I will say to you that, and and I'm not glad handing or anything, but. You know, that that was kind of the differential over the years. You know, Chad pressed at RTI, and I kept pushing RTI. We ended up having our own press to press the 200-gram stuff. Chad was pressing 180, and they were great pressings, great mastering, great titles. They sold really well. But I kept pushing, pushing, pushing. And I will say that one of the things I'm most proud of is that when Chad brought Classic Records and the pressing plant, that he... Um, assumed that spirit, that spirit of trying to improve things. And I, like I said, I said before, you know, he's really elevated it beyond the level that I got it to. And I laud that effort now that like, you know what? It's about the legacy, right? It's about doing things the best that you possibly can at the time that you're doing them. And I feel like I did that at Classic Records, and that's our legacy at Classic Records. And, you know, that's something that I passed on to Chad, and he's now, like, taken that baton and, like, literally run that last leg with it. And it's, it's beautiful to watch. It really is. I'm, I, every, I, I went out to Salina for the first time a couple of years ago, and I was absolutely blown away at uh the level of that operation it's it's really something to behold and um uh, you know the old saying nobody does it better well you know um i wanted to make this video um because we're gonna doing like a history of classic records yeah because a lot of people that are just getting into this there's a couple of new companies that are uh, are getting into it in a big way. Uh, Vinyl Me Please. Yeah. You know, and I'm trying to show them how it should be done, why it's important, each step of the way. Uh, we, I want all records to sound better because yeah. I, I listen. Yeah. And you listen. Right. To them, and you want your favorite record to sound, sound the, better. As better. best it can. And well, isn't it amazing how every time you we cut a record and we compare it to the original, the, how a, a lot of times you really smoke the original. Yeah. And then you know what? What, what the first thing that comes to my mind, and it happens over and over, yeah. that every record that exists could sound better yeah. than it does. I believe that to be the case. And yeah. and so, so anyway, we're trying to. Uh, so these new companies that are just coming on the scene and, and they're doing a good job, they don't know of, of the, the struggles yeah. that came before yeah. them, you yeah. know? And I think yeah. the same thing with like wrestlers or pro football players or, you know, right. all those guys that, in, I don't want to say invented the sport, but yeah. the wrestlers, those guys, it's now these guys are just making millions on millions. I'm talking about sports and stuff, sure, but sure. it's the the race car drivers that died, you know, right. racing and it yeah. was doing it in danger, you yeah. know, yeah. and and so they don't really know about classic records, about how we started, yeah, how we kind of started together, yeah, and and you know. I, I want this to be documented and to be known. Now, now Fremer knows about it, and and there's a few people we know who those people were yeah. that were doing what we did or right. were with us right. that weren't running from the CD. Yeah. We know that Don and Rick at RTI and Gary and yeah. and, and and Doug Sachs and yeah. Bernie Grunman and yeah. and and uh, and Michael Fremer and you and a few others. Few others, few others, yeah, were putting everything they had 
in the belief in investing in this thing. And I, we know who they were. But we also know the people that were running as fast as they can yeah. from it. And yeah. there, and we see them coming back. Oh, I love Varner the whole time. <laughs> yeah, pal. You the first son of a bitch I saw running, <laughs> you know. But yeah. but that's fine. We won't call yeah. them out by names, but they yeah. know who they are. Yeah. But it, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, we're you know, we were we we're Chad and I were just talking um, over lunch the other day about you know audio files and about records and be nice to you know be able to expose people to the quality sound that you can get from a hi-fi system of uh, an analog hi-fi system and so forth. And, you know, that's always been the dream, but um, it, it takes a, <clears throat> a level of devotion. You have to be able to take a record out and hold it in your hands and put it onto the platter and bring this turn the, the tone arm over and drop it down. And then you have to sit and listen. And, you know, maybe it's a song, maybe it's the whole side, but it's an experience. And you have to be that type of person, an experiential person. Now, that's a music lover, but there are a lot of other music lovers that consume music in a different way, you know. At the time Chad was talking about, those were people that were running for the aisles, a lot of which he didn't name, but are well-known hi-fi reviewers who have come back to vinyl, um, who ran out the door to digital. And not that digital's bad, but it's it's easier, right? It You can play it in the background. You don't have to worry about something getting to the end of the side and taking the vinyl, you know. You don't have to sit down, you can do other things. And now, you know, streaming is the next level up from that. You know, you don't even have to put a CD on, you can put a playlist on and you can still enjoy music and enjoying music's what it's really all about. But enjoying music on vinyl requires a level of devotion and attention. You have to carve out a piece of time to sit down and and it's like watching a movie, right? You know, you can't watch you can't really watch dishes and watch a movie. In the same way you can't wash dishes and listen to a vinyl. You have to take the time, you know. And that's that's an experience that you know, not everybody prioritizes or or loves, but you know, if if it's something that you've experienced and if you haven't, you should. But if, if, if it's something that moves your soul, like it does mine, like it does Chad's, um, there's nothing like it. You know, it's, it's, a, mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an experience. We were just listening, I mean, and it's like, you know, we went deep, deep into a trance, you know, basically. Yeah. And uh, it's just a natural high. But, uh, you know... It's, uh, you know, I don't have nothing against CD, you know, I mean, yeah. maybe a, a little, but, you know, but, but as far as you, it's, it's for, you, you play it when you're, you're vacuuming or you're doing something or it's background right. or you're in the car. Right. I, I like having, you know, uh, both formats, but when I really want to seriously listen, you know, I put on an album, you know, like one of my favorite saying is, you know, an LP draws you into the music. I said, you know, yeah. put it on a CD and even dogs leave the room. Right, right, right. You know? right. So yeah. it, it just is, uh, it, it's not uh, as pleasing or, it, but, but it's, 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 it has a purpose. Yeah. And I use yeah. each thing for, for the best purpose at the time. And, uh, right. but if we're going to sit down and, really listen, you know, it's going to be a vinyl or, or the thing that's going to hit my emotion and soul uh, is going to be the vinyl. But no, I just, I just thought that we should talk uh, about, you know, to me, it's just like I record these blues guys to preserve the uh, blues. We, we're trying to incredible. keep vinyl and the blues alive, but yeah. we're also the history 
of, of the music, but also this history is important. Yeah. And I mean, me and you know it, but we might even forget some of it. We need yeah. to, I think it's important and I think, well, I just think it's important and, and maybe somebody else will too. But if nothing else, to set the facts straight yeah. or, or just to let people know, hey, listen, you know, there was a day in 1991 that hardly anything was coming out on vinyl. Absolutely. And there were, you and know. And you put it out. Uh, you were right. brave. And you then, were brave. And I think, to be honest, again, not to glad hand you, but I think you and the few other peoples, including Wilson and a few others, that were like sprinkling things out, were just kind of kept things going, man. And and without that, it, it wouldn't, uh, and the dub guys, we wouldn't be here right now and, and vinyl wouldn't have made a resurgence because it would have died. And, um, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's heartening. My children who are teenagers now are into vinyl and, uh, it's, it's, it's really a wonderful thing. And they don't really know a lot about my part in the vinyl resurgence and, or your part in the vinyl resurgence as well. But, um, yeah, I you know it's 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 a good thing. Well, that's why I said I just wanted to document it. I was telling some of the newcomers, yeah, uh, about uh, what you had did and and where it came from and and uh, and you know I I just thought that this would be a better way of of documenting the whole story, um, and. Uh, you know, for the next, you know, we did it for 35 years. We'll do it for another, you know, hopefully another 35. It'd, it'd be great, man. <laughs> it'd be great. You know, it's interesting. One of the things I just wanted to, like, add was, and I think you'll agree, is that the that the market's changed dramatically in, in a number of ways, which I, many of which I won't go into. But one interesting thing to me is that uh, in the early days of the reissue trend, which you know, arguably Chad was involved in, I picked up and, and we both then carried the ball forward. And others, there were others, you know, there uh, are companies in um, Europe, uh, Speaker's Corner and and a few others that- Mobile that Fidelity. Mobile Fidelity. In the, they, they, they have like three three parts of their history. Yeah. They had the JVC Super Vinyl, right. which actually is, the thing that got me interested yeah. in reissues, you know what I mean? Right. Like that, right. that we wanted to, uh, and then they had the Anna disc, which is 200 the, gram. Yeah, 200. Oddly, but you know, yeah, it wasn't a flat profile. Right. And then right. they did um, on alpha two Lexus, by the way, just a little jab to Chad, but <laughs> maybe that's another story. But, uh, so they, um, there was, there was and now the, the latest incarnation of mobile fidelity as well. Which, um, you know, it's like, look, um, it, well, but the, the point I was going to make is that in the day, we were going up against, like, we were being reviewed against original copies. So, like, when, when we did a reissue, Chad or myself, you know, the, these reviewers were like, oh, well, how does it sound against the original? And, it, you know, there's a whole, a, a lot of politics around, you know, Oh, I've got this original copy, and it's really rare, and no one else has it, and so I'm I'm a big dog, you know, and so like somebody comes along and they put this reissue out, it's like, well, it can't be as good as my original, right? Well, yeah, but I mean, they also got either all the time they're so proud of finding it when we were, <laughs> yeah, we were just like them, or they might have spent a thousand dollars on it, yeah, well, their exactly. investment might have went down, you know, yeah. if they. They had a hundred RCAs that were worth five hundred dollars a piece. Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> they don't they don't want to see something come and destroy the market, which of course is exactly what we did. We didn't intend to do that. We didn't. We weren't trying to destroy the market for collectibles, but we did by virtue of doing, I think, at least in my opinion, a much better job on the reissues than was than than they were able to do. 30 or 40 years prior to us, you know, the technology had improved. Well, to the, the tape point. machine got better. The yeah. tape heads got better. The cutter heads yeah. got better. And so we, we and were able to do a better job. Still, 
and the tape held up. Yeah, it was you know. it was in great shape. You know, a lot of those tapes, like people said, oh, you know, the tapes, they wear out. It's like, you know what? They really don't. They sound incredible. Well, if you've I mean, ever heard an original master tape, it's like, oh! You'd, you'd get three tracks on Kind yeah. of Blue. Yeah. Three tracks on, on Brubeck, Time yeah. Out. Three yeah. tracks on, on the, the RCAs, RCAs, the, the Mercury's. Mercury's. It's like, look, when you can go back to the most original source and play that back, I mean, that's as good as it gets, right? But again, that's only part of the story, right? You have to do the cutting right. You have to do the mastering and cutting right. You have to get the plating done quickly and in the best possible way. And then you have to press it on the on the best machine with the best profile and the best vinyl. And it just never ends. I mean, it just never ends. But but the but what I was really trying to get to was uh, back to the point that we had to compete against the originals back when we were doing the reissues. And now, and I'm not, you know, I'm not really complaining, but now when in, when a version of Bob Dylan Blood on the Trash comes out, nobody's comparing it to the original. They're just excited that it's available, right? So the the market, the vinyl market has changed. It's really about availability now. It's like, oh yeah, look at that title. That Tom Waits title is available, or there's a Tom Petty box. It's like, you know, and I'm I'm happy about that. I'm happy. There's a company uh, that. Chad's doing business with here in Los Angeles. Amazing store, super vinyl. It's in Hollywood. It's it's like the Gucci of vinyl record stores, right? And Chad's got his stuff in there. And it's it's amazing. But you know, people walk into that store and they look at what's available and they don't go, "Oh, is this better than the original?" They go like, "This is amazing." All this stuff's out on vinyl. They're excited, you know, and that's it's really heartening to me that we're not caught in that rut anymore of, well, is it better than the original? How does it compare to the original? It's like, you know what? I'm I'm kind of moaning and complaining a lot, but it turns out that in the day when there was some controversy, it caused the consumer to say, well, let, uh, you know, I should hear this. You know, I, I mean, even if they well, say it's, it, it you know. it took a while. I mean, I can remember because, you know, we were selling them and, and we had that um, th that comments or those thoughts. But once it finally, like a few years later, yeah. like, I mean, the, you know, it was just like this and it was like people just, Hey, thirty dollars for a brand new, clean on Virgin vinyl, pressed at RTI, mastered at Bernie with a brand new jacket, and I, you know, I've yeah. been paying three hundred dollars, ticks and all, yeah, these, exactly. chasing down these, going to garage sales, you yeah. know, Salvation Army, yeah. And then once you, it just took a while, you know, it's it's a, uh, and then once you started uh, hitting big titles like. Uh, Kind of blue and and Zeppelin and that. Then yeah, uh, everybody had something to buy uh, that you know the types of music they liked and right, and it just was like a slow. And now you know it's like this. Yeah. And uh, but you know what I'll say a lot is I say you know what people ask me how did did you see this coming did yeah. you see this coming I says. <laughs> Well, you know, I didn't really see it. I, I said, I trusted my ears, and I knew vinyl would never die. Right. But right. I didn't see CDs dying like it did. I didn't either. And I can't see that I saw the day that your children and my children and right. other children would be buying vinyl records. records. Uh, me did you? I mean, I didn't. Because I, I know didn't. if you told me, and I asked Don McKinnis that and Fremer that, and they all say the same thing. We did not see this coming. Again, I, I know we all knew it wouldn't die because we put everything we had into it and we loved it. And we knew people would trust their ears, but we didn't see yeah. it no. coming. And uh, and then I guess the last thing uh, is we, uh, you know, the last thing you had was your archive. Yeah. One of everything. Yeah. 
and uh, it's tempting for me yeah. to keep uh, that, but uh, I... I mean, I got to tell you, you know, when you bought Classic Records and uh, you, you didn't take the archive, I was like, well, I'm kind of happy about that, you know? And so nine years later, you know, uh, or maybe even a little before that, you were like, hey, you know, uh, what about that archive, man? Should I, you know, what if, should we talk about that? So it took us a few years to to figure it out and negotiate. And uh, and I'm, I'm happy that it finally went to acoustic sounds. And, you know, my attitude was that uh, the archive was really um, a document of what we had done. So, you know, of course, no archives complete. It's like, you know, to, you, know you, you tell your production people and so forth every time something, you know, take two copies and put it in the archive and put it down on the list and you know, you get it about 95, 97% right, and that's as good as it gets. And uh, but, It looks but, pretty right to me, yeah, man. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the most complete document. Um, even, uh, I'll be honest, uh, from a documentation standpoint, better than my personal archive, um, which is not as extensive as the Classic Records archive, and I'm glad that, that Chad got it. Um, and, and that it's in Salina right now, and it was five pallets worth of material uh, that got shipped out. And uh, yeah, yeah, my my archive of, of classic isn't nearly yeah. is is complete. In fact, yeah. that's why I want to keep it. Yeah, but it's just too much. Yeah, value there. It's a know. lot. Right, we can it's buy a, a couple of yeah. presses or... I mean, look, there, there's stuff there that there are, you know, five of a kind. And, and there are things that I didn't keep or that I didn't, you know, like, because you can't, you can't, can't you can't keep, keep track of it all, right? right? You know, like, if you see it, you go, oh, yeah, I remember that. Oh, but I don't have a copy of that. You know what I mean? It's like, it, it there's just too many things to keep track of. And, um, yeah, there's some real rarity some real goodies things that didn't come out things you know that that uh, you know we experimented with i mean one of the things that's that's interesting i think people don't know about is and it was the craziest thing this whole 45 rpm craze right well hey, hey wait i need to give you the yeah credit on that this whole 45 thing started with you well, I mean, it uh, well, did. No, really, well, but. yeah, but it's just like somebody did a few and you made it a standard. Yeah, I mean, there were always 45 RPM pressings, singles. You know, there, I know, there were 12 inch 45s. Yeah, yeah, the 12 inch 45s, but there, there were other things that were like. They came out, Mike, but dude, you made, yeah. it, you made it a standard and people had to understand why it was uh, better. But, but anyway. But I mean, I to be honest, to... but to be honest with you, you know, thanks for, you know, giving me a little credit, but, you know, it didn't start out that way. Again, you know, I, I, it, it'd be nice, you know, go, oh, yeah, I saw where this was going. I plant No. You know what? We were cutting at Grunman's, and we were cutting LSC 1806, the first title we cut. And, you know, we were kind of like, oh, you know, what, what would this be like at 45? And Grunman goes, well, it'd be a lot better. And we went, okay, well, let's, let's cut part of it at 45, just, as a, just for fun. So we cut the sunrise of 1806, you know. And so it's LSE uh, 1806 A1 or A45. And, and there are copies in the archive. And there's probably 10 copies of it in existence, right? And it, but it wasn't the whole side. It was just like, because you can't cut at 45, obviously. You can only cut, you know, about mm, half or less than a half of what you would cut at 33. So you can't cut the whole side. You have to break it up which is inconvenient. So we cut part of the sunrise and then we cut a B45. And then we started, you know, we cut like on LSE 2222. We only cut one tune, Alvarado del Gracio. We didn't cut the whole album at 45. We only cut one tune from the original three track. And then LSE 1817, the Gaete Parisienne. We, you know, at first we only cut a couple of pieces. They were just experimental. 
You know, we didn't have any idea of commercializing them. And then at some point I went, you know what? These things sound good. Let's just cut them for ourselves, right? Maybe we'll bring them out, but let's just, like, we'll cut them because they sound good. And so, you know, like, we can, so why don't we? And we did. And then at some point we had all the parts and we went back to the record company. We said, hey, let's do it like this. And went, sure. And there you go. You know, it was that next step up in terms of playback fidelity. And, you know, regardless of the vinyl formula, the profile, whatever, when you cut it at a higher speed and play back at a higher speed, the stylus is able to negotiate, let's call it, all of the groove modulations more easily. So there's less playback distortion, right? If the cartridge can't get all of the information exactly, that's called playback distortion. But if you play it at a higher speed where the cartridge has a, an opportunity to get all of those groove modulations, then it gets it more right, less groove, modul less groove um, distortion, and the effects in playback are wonderful. So, you know, we, and we just, you know, basically reissued our reissues at 45 and other companies including Chad and Mobile Fidelity and so forth have picked that up as a way of getting the most out of vinyl playback that you possibly can. Yes, there's an inconvenience. You have to get up and you know you can't listen to an entire side. But you know what? If you want the ultimate in playback fidelity, you'll buy a 45 RPM UHQR Clarity Vinyl hand pressed from Acoustic Sounds. <laughs> well, dude, that's a good way to end, man. I want to thank you for all what you've done, what you brought to, to the this vinyl world and passing it on to me. And I want to thank you for starting it all because I really feel like that you were instrumental in starting it and getting it like, like lighting the fire, you know, getting the kindling going. And then, you know, I started throwing some logs on the fire and you started throwing some gasoline on the fire. And Well, you threw some pretty big <laughs> logs, man. Led so, Zeppelin. Yeah. You threw some big logs, some, 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 uh, but you know, um, you know, you, you did what you did and then you, um, uh, shared it with me you continue to share it with me yeah you continue to be uh like a mentor and a cheerleader and a absolutely stoking the coals 100 percent, and keeping it yeah and uh and i like i said i just before we get too old too much old <laughs> i want to remember, yeah. remember this stuff because yeah. i think the history is important yeah. and a lot of people don't know the history yeah. And uh and maybe they don't care, but yeah. if they care, that's you know, uh straight yeah. out the horse's mouth, you yeah. know. Uh yeah. You know what? I just wanna uh, the and 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 uh, we've already kind of self congratulated each other enough. <laughs> but you know, the one thing I do wanna say is I wanna give a shout out to a couple people that were very important in this process. And I want to say thank you to Jerry Gladstein for not uh, going the distance and, and going and starting Classic Records with me. I think it would have been a disaster had, had it continued. And I, I appreciate the fact that you pulled out and let me go on with it. And I want to say thank you to Ying Tan who started Classic Records. Uh, I brought him in and said, do you want to participate in this? And he participated for about a year and then uh, decided to exit. But I want to say that, you know, those were people that were supportive in one way or another, not nearly as important as the guy sitting next to me in terms of the success of everything. But, uh, you know, I, I want to acknowledge those folks as well. And many other people who have, um, carried on the, the desire and the devotion towards vinyl 
not the least of which is Harry Pearson. Uh, God rest his soul, uh, was an absolute devotee to vinyl, um, cared a lot about uh, the classic records, was a very big supporter. Michael Fremer has always been a, a great supporter of vinyl. And, and to all the customers that bought classic records and bought acoustic sounds records and, and continue to, to carry on that spirit, I say thank you from my heart. You know, I love you guys. I love you all. And um, Don McKinnis at RTI, Rick Hashimoto 100%. at RTI, Gary Salstrom from RTI, now QRP. Yeah. Uh, and and I know we both have the same uh, uh, feelings towards them and what yeah, they've absolutely. done. Yeah, um, absolutely. And so I mentioned them as well, but it's yeah. like both of us. And... Uh, and there, there's others, but I mean those uh, and, and Bernie Grunman, yeah, and Doug, Doug Sachs, Sachs, right? Um, yeah, there the list goes on. And, Kevin Gray, yeah. Stan yeah. Ricker, absolutely. Uh, and then again, the reviewers, Fremer, Robinson, Dave Robinson. Uh, there've been customers and fans, uh, and 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 reviewers, uh, and they also. The customers egging you on to reissue yeah. things, yeah, or or, yeah. or turning you on to things, yeah. I, I mean, listen, you know, uh, growing up in South Louisiana, I didn't exactly, yeah, uh, know much about classical. You know, right. Right. we didn't have uh, Claude yeah. Boudreaux and yeah. the Opelousa Symphony. You know what I'm the saying? The plow that broke the plane. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Who was Stravinsky? Uh, yeah. yeah. And I mean, I shoot, I barely can pronounce some of it still, you yeah. know, but you, you don't really have to know it. You just so have to know it. if you like it or not. Exactly. Put it exactly. on and if it moves you. If it moves you, you then you but, um, yeah. but still, I, I didn't, you know, it was the customer that educated me. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with that. You know, but still, customer often knows more than you do and you can learn from them. And uh, yeah, yeah. I, I concur with that. I, I learned a lot from people. Well, dude, thanks for, right, for doing this, man. Absolutely. All right, thanks.